All right. Uh, welcome to the Hispanic Reading Room in the Library of Congress. My name is Suzanne Schadel, and I have the privilege of being the chief in the Hispanic Division as of October. Uh, it is my pleasure to recognize, I pulled the wrong introduction, it's my pleasure to recognize Catalina Gomez, who is one of our wonderful reference librarians here in the Hispanic Division and our curator of the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape. I want to thank her for organizing this event in, um, in collaboration with the European Division, which is our neighbor. If you keep walking through our reading room, you'll find their reading room. And also with the Alan Chose International Writing Center with George Mason University and with the Embassy of Argentina. Thank you all for helping us pull people together around a celebration of literature. I'd also like to thank our distinguished guests, who someone else will introduce. This is how we do it. We do multiple introductions. Um, and a celebration of translation, of poetry, of French, and of Spanish, and most importantly, of Alejandra Pizarnik. Uh, I have a special place in my heart for South American writers of Ukrainian ancestry. It's a little known fact. No. Uh, people who know me know that I I have a thing, especially for women of Ukrainian ancestry who write out of South America, and Pizarnik is certainly among them because of her mastery of words and the way that she could put them to profound feeling. And with an austerity that really belies the incredible labor of her work. So I say that here because it is with deep respect that I welcome her translators. Forrest Gander, Patricio Ferrari, Ana Dini Morales, who will share their work in channeling hers, which I think is just an amazing feat. So thank you all. Uh, this event, The Galloping Hour, French Poems by Alejandra Pizarnik, is part of a series that we are organizing here in the Hispanic Division called Create and Connect. The idea is to create content. So for your information, if you're asking questions this evening, you are in an audio-visual capture that will become part of our collections. That is content uh, that you'll all be able to access one day. Um, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to connect with people who are familiar with our space and who are not familiar with our space, who are familiar with uh, the content that we help deliver in this space and who are not familiar with that content. Uh, you'll see a survey. This is just to get a sense of who you are in that mix. If you're willing to fill that out, we would appreciate it. Uh, the Library of Congress has its own organizational tool this year for pulling together events and making connections across the organization, and that is through an annual theme. And this year, the theme is America's change makers. I know that uh, I'm in a group of friends when I say we define America as very broad here. Uh, and I want to say a quick thing about crossing languages as we talk about change makers, um, both in the context of translation and then in the context of writing in a second language for Pizarnik that was writing in French instead of Spanish. Uh, communicating human nuance across languages is a precious exercise in change making. It brings people who may not naturally communicate together in ways that open new avenues for understanding one another. And I believe, and hopefully everyone in the audience believes, that we need more of that and not less of it. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to turn this microphone over to Deputy Chief Heraldo Diaz Bartolomé from the Embassy of Argentina, who will introduce one of our panel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Gerardo Diaz Bartolomé, Jerry, as everybody calls me, I'm the Deputy Ambassador of the Embassy of Argentina. It's a big pleasure to be here with you all. For the Embassy of Argentina, it's a great honor to be here at the Library of Congress to highlight the work of Alejandra Pizarnik, one of the most powerful and intense lyric poets in the mid 20th century in Argentina. I want to especially thank Suzanne Schadel, Director of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress for inviting us to be part of this special event. We really appreciate it. Yeah. It is always a pleasure for us to work together with you and share our literature and our culture. I also want to thank the invaluable work of Forrest Gander, 
Patricio Ferrari and Ana Dini Morales for translating the exquisite poems written by Pizarnik during her short and productive life. Those poems rendered in English for the first time are a subtle synthesis of her personal life experiences. And on a personal note, I feel particularly moved because I'm a translator myself. <laughs> I'm a diplomat, but I studied translation uh, uh, in Argentina. And uh, I was telling my friends that paradoxically, that career did prevented me many years ago from becoming a diplomat in my country. <laughs> yeah, it was not considered as one of the careers uh, many years ago. So I studied foreign affairs after that. I graduated first and then I studied something else. And, uh, but paradoxically, as I said, the, 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 it's not the mastery because I don't master languages, but the, 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 my linguistic formation, my linguistic background is what has, has been more useful in, in my current job as a diplomat. Wow. So uh, it's a good way to my revenge. <laughs> <I would say. laughs> but it is true, it is true. So today we bring you not only a refined writer, but also a clear example of the diversity of our country. Pizarnik was born in Buenos Aires to Ukrainian Jewish immigrant parents, like many others in Argentina. She studied philosophy and literature at the Universidad de Buenos Aires before she moved to Paris, where she befriended writers such as Octavio Paz, Julio Cortázar, and Silvina Campos, nothing less. She was also a model for the new generation of Argentinian writers and poets. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to be here today with you at this event made in the collaboration with the Alan Schuster International Writing Center, the George Mason University, and the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. I'm Gwen Kirkpatrick from Georgetown University, and I am delighted to be here tonight to be included. Um, Pizarnik, Alejandra Pizarnik is a particular favorite of mine. I've even written on her. And her, I must say her star grows brighter by the year. She was uh, somewhat of a cult favorite for some years, maybe 20, 30 years ago. And every year that passes, she becomes better known. And I'm delighted that you three have worked to make her known to different audiences, more audiences and different audiences. My job is to introduce the translators. Uh, first, Forrest Gander is a writer and translator. Among his most recent books are Be With, the novel, The Trace, and Echo and Coma, a collaboration with the eponymous movement artists. Gander's book, Core Samples from the World, it was a great title, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Gander is also a translator whose recent works includes, include Alice Iris Red Horse, poems by Goso Yoshimasu, and Then Come Back, the Lost Neruda program poems. Okay. Um, far, on my far left, uh, Argentinian born, Patricio Ferrari has translated poetry from French, Alejandra Pizarnik, Portuguese, Fernando Pessoa, Antonio Osorio, English, Frank Stanford, Lainey Brown, and Hindi, Bidroi. A polyglot, as is evident from that list, his work as a poet, editor, and translator bridges a life between languages. Recently, he edited and co-translated with Forrest The Galloping Hour of French Poems by Alejandra Pizarnik, New Directions, which is here. Um, Ferrari resides in New York City and teaches at Rutgers. While serving as managing director of San Patricio Language Institute, a school in Greater Buenos Aires that his mother founded in 1971. I think that's great. Uh, and Anadini Morales is a translator, literary critic, and dramatist. 
Her translations of Rao Sorita's works include Purgatory, Dreams for Kuros Kurosawa, and Sky Below selected works, of which she is also the editor. She has also translated works by the Argentinian Mercedes Rofe, Pizarnik, and the Uruguayan Amanda Berenguer, among others. Original works and adaptations for contemporary dance, theater, and opera include La Straniera, Tela di Ragno, Cecilio Valdez, and La Paloma at the Wall, which is coming soon as an opera. Uh, 2019 National Endowment for the Arts recipient for the translation of Tala by Gabriela Mistral. Uh, Dini Morales holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and teaches at Georgetown University. And I can say she is a brilliant teacher. Um, she teaches with the Center of Latin American Studies and also Spanish and Portuguese. She also co-directs the Gabriela Mistral Youth Poetry Competition, which is for local schools, children writing poetry. So you see we have a stellar focus with Alejandra Pizarnik and also very stellar translators, editors, writers, multi-talented crew. Hmm. So I will turn hmm. it over to them. Thank you, Gwen. So <clears throat> I thought we would talk very briefly about how we each came to Pizarnik and something about our um, translations. <clears throat> um, for me, Pizarnik was a figure sort of in the margins of my consciousness. You, um, anyone interested in Latin American poetry knows about her. She has a reputation that, that permeates all of Latin America. and. Um, and is international beyond that. <clears throat> but it wasn't really until I was working on an anthology with Raul Zurita, the great Chilean poet that Anadini has translated, um, called Pinholes in the Night, Essential Poems from Latin America, that Zurita insisted that I get serious about reading Pizarnik. And, um, and that was my that was my big turn on. And I asked uh, Anadini at that time to translate uh, the Pizarnik for our anthology. And you'll hear some of her translations later on today. Later, um, I was teaching at Brown University. I came into contact with Patricio Ferrari, um, who was already a Pizarnik aficionado, um, partly through his work um, uh, with, uh, with Pessoa he, uh, that had sort of connected. Um, and um, we were, um, and the first book of Pizarnik that was published in the US was published by my press, this press, New, New Directions. And it was a little pamphlet. Um, and it, uh, um, it wasn't very, we didn't think it was very good. So we fell in together about, Need, needing some more Pizarnik translations. In fact, that translator does a much better job on her subsequent and larger translation of Pizarnik. But her first effort, um, just it seems like her first effort, probably like my first efforts in translation. Um, so, um, so it was uh, Patricio who who thought that maybe we should do the uh, the French poems, which no one. Uh, no one had been talking about and that he knew quite a bit about. And I followed Patricio's lead. I thought I would say a little bit about um, why it's difficult to translate Pizarnik. Um, and uh, there's lots of reasons, but among them are the fact that she uses a very talismanic vocabulary, certain words that come up over and over again, things like sleep, death, infancy, terror, night, mirror. And she um, shifts a surrealism that she sort of inherited 
um, as an Argentine writer conversant with French in the early 1960s towards dreams and a very emotionally fraught dreams of self-reflection. So that becomes a difficult um, territory to think about translating. And one of the ways you can get into trouble as a translator into English, translating her work, since she's using some kind of these, uh, these talismanic words that are sort of generic, and because Spanish is a romance language, it can, um, if you follow the Latinate uh, roots of the words, translating them into English, you often end up with a very vacuous kind of translation. And so one of the things that, um, that we were looking to do was to make sure we were drawing on Anglo-Saxon words. Um, so as a little example, um, so you know, given, given a, a phrase like la plume verte, um, we would not translate it as the verdant plume. Um, <laughs> We would go for that green feather, um, which are Anglo-Saxon words. Or in a French line, line like this one. On peut sentir que le cœur est dans la jambe et l'eau dans l'ancien lieu du cœur. When we hit sentir, better to veer away from sense um, and use the Frisian or Old Sax Saxon fiel for feel. So feel instead of sense instead of lu, um, not locale or locus, but the Anglo-Saxon site. Instead of est, um, which is just a verb to be, um, we went ahead and, um, and used the Anglo-Saxon thud, which you'll hear when we read this poem. And that's a, that's a kind of risky thing. It's putting a, a, an active verb in where there's a passive verb in, 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 in the French. And we justify it because the music of her line there, which you'll hear in the French, um, is completely lost if we use the, the abstract verb in English. And so um, I hope you'll hear how the thud brings the music into, into the English translation. Anna, do you want to say something about your Translation, and then we'll get to Absolutely. Sure. Um, so, uh, yes, thankfully, uh, Forrest asked me if I wanted to participate in this beautiful book, Bin Holes in the Night. And I said I would translate the women of the book, who were Gabriela Mistral, Idea Vilarino, who's a Uruguayan writer, Mistral is a Chilean writer, and, and Alejandra Pizarnik. Um, so, I guess I'm, I'm going to use your word, Suzanne, austere. There's a, um, quite an austerity to her, to her poetry, and it, it, it's very wound up. So um, you can't uh, give or take words very easily. It's, it's not like Raul Zurita's poetry, who, who I translated a lot, and where you very easily can add um, multiple verbs, and the helping verb, and the gerund. This is poetry that is very, very tightly wound. And, um, and I don't want to say it's brittle, but it's certainly dense, compact, and hard. That, that would be the, those would be the synesthetic terms I'd use. Something about this poetry, so I, I wanted to give you an example of Pizarnik's exacting nature. So um, I'm, I'm going to give you um, a workshoppy example of that, just to give you. So, so when a poet is exacting like that, because really you translate, the, the poetry teaches you how to translate that mm. poem. So you, for at least for me, you know, I don't come to translation with an, a, a preset of, of ideas of, OK, well, I'm going to translate. This is how you translate poetry. No, that, that poetry itself teaches you how to do the work in the new language. And I think, how am I going to sound these concepts, this nature of, this, of what this human being is trying to say in, in this new language? And it's interesting. Thank you for your lovely introduction. And thank you, Gwen, for your <laughs> lovely introductions as well. You know, you said that. Um, 
you said that translation is your linguistic formation, but you know, it's also a formation in a human sensibility. You know, how we learn language, how we learn stories is teaching us how to be human in a certain way, no? So, um, so anyway, let me give an example. There's this beautiful poem that's poem um, 13 from uh, Diana's Tree, which is Arbol de Diana. And it's, it's as follows, explicar con palabras de este mundo que partió de mí un barco llevándome. So those, it's just two lines, it's very simple, but it's, each line is 11 syllables. So each line is an um, in decasílaba. But it's interesting because, so um, she places the emphasis, and decasyllables have their, their tradition of emphases. And in the first line, explicar con palabras. The emphasis is on the sixth and then the tenth syllable, okay? Explicar con palabras de este mundo, okay? But then on the, in the second line, so she's talking about explaining with words of this world. Then the second line, she talks about a break or a, a cut or a split or a birthing and a boat and then a taking away, okay? In the second line, she shifts those emphases to the fifth and the ninth syllables. How exacting is that? <laughs> See, so she actually, in the syllabic, in the, she creates a very light rocking. So the first line is explicar con palabras de este mun mundo, okay? Mundo. Then the second line, que partió de, que partió, Que partió de mí? Un barco llevándome. So, bandome is the ninth. So, she goes from six and ten emphasis to five and nine in each line using 11 syllables. Okay, so how do you replicate that? Do you know where how, it, really the word shouldn't be replicated. It's how do you think about that in this different language? So, I often, ref, it, you know, I refer to different writers, and, but in the case of, Bisarnik, a, a similar writer who has that harsh austerity is Emily Dickinson. Hmm. So she uses, um, an, what she'll do is, is use an iambic quatrain followed by a, an iambic tetrameter. And I know this sounds really technical, <laughs> but it's just so everybody cool. Should you know, everybody should, yeah, everybody should know this. This is your human formation. <laughs> um, so she, for example, because I did not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Yeah. Okay, so there's an example of a stop, right? A continuation and a stop. So it's actually the inversion, whereas in the Pisarnik, it's, it's a, like a rocking this way. In this sense, it's like it's a stopping, right? There's a continuation of the first line that stops you short in the second line. So I thought, well, what if I invert those rhythms and use three feet for the first line and then four feet for the second line to create a sense of taking forward. So here, this is what I came up with. So these are three iambic feet followed by four iambic feet, okay? Explain with words of this world that bore of me a boat elsewhere. So do you see how there's this very light rocking forward? And then to really make it be sarnique, I made the entire thing um, uh, a verso el Alejandrino, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is 14 syllables, because she was also, she has this other poem that's Alejandra, Alejandra, debajo estoy yo Alejandra, which if you count it, it's 14 syllables, and that's from another book. So the point is, is that I always say it was at Heather Streckfuss Green, who's also um, from George Mason, she's a professor here of translation, who, um, hosted me last week and, and is going to host Patricio and, and um, Forrest tomorrow. That, you know, so I'm, we're explaining these, this information to you about our processes. Um, but I do believe that people feel this. So they may not, you're not receiving this as information about you know, when you're hearing this, you're not, you're not hearing, oh, one plus one is two, two plus two is four, five people were killed, ten the other day, the location, the names, no? But you're feeling 
these rhythms in a different way. And so that's what this language is teaching you about, about the different places in your bodies and different ways and modes of knowing language, which also means different ways of knowing other people beyond the information that you're hearing from those words. No? So, so it was a huge pleasure to learn from Pisaramik, and, and I'm very honored to be here with Gwen Kirkpatrick, who was actually my poetry teacher yeah. at Berkeley, <laughs> and, with, um, and with Forrest and Patricio, who, who brought me into this project in the first place. And thanks for coming. So. Buenas tardes a todos. It is a uh, deep pleasure, gratitude, um, what I feel today among friends, friends of friends, poets, this room, los murales de Portinari. And uh, when we walked in with, with Ana, I felt that we had to ask permission um, to silence, to, to speak here. And um, it is uh, really an honor and uh, to to share Pizarnik um, here in this uh, in this grand place. Y que haya gente de la embajada argentina me da mucho honor, me da realmente mucha felicidad en el periodo que estamos pasando. Realmente es un es un gesto. Um, and it is a gesture also for all of you to come out on a cold day to hear poetry. Ay madre un sitio en el mundo que se llama París. Un sitio muy grande y lejano y grande otra vez. <laughs> and Alejandra felt this, knew this, as so many of her of poets had before Alejandra. Those words were uh, by uh, César Vallejo, uno de sus grandes maestros, grandes compañeros de poesía que Alejandra tuvo como muchos. And Alejandra went to Paris in 1960. Alejandra went to Paris uh, feeling that she had to go to Paris. By 1955, she was in her teens and she writes in her diary, recordar que tengo que ir a París y lo tengo que querer y tengo que ir. Y, y fue. And she got on a ship March 11th and she went to Paris. And there she lived for for four years, and there she produced the poems that Anna uh, read uh, today. When uh, Arbol de Diana comes out in December of 62 in, in Buenos Aires, uh, Alejandra is in Paris, and, and uh, Octavio Paz writes the preface, the poems on their own right stand, and overnight, Alejandra is, is a poet. It's her fourth book. At the time, she will go on to write many more very prolific in her lifetime, and trust me, very prolific after her death. We will be reading new works of Pizarnik, hopefully every year for many, many years. She left an archive, she left treasures. They're very well kept in Princeton University. That's where I found these poems. Other people before me had found them, read them, knew about them. But for some reason, no press had published these poems. And uh, when, uh, thanks to Forrest, and I came to know the name of New Directions, and I thought I would like to knock on that door because this, is, this could be a good home for Alejandra. And when I met Declan Spring, and here I would like to thank him and, and Barbara Epler for having accepted. This, this manuscript of poems that for other publishers were thought to be minor poems, poems of, of uh, no uh, necessity and need in the, in the Pizarnik canon. And when we read the translations that Anna did of Avro de Diana, we see how intertwined, how much in dialogue they are with these French poems. Alejandra came to be into her poetry because of French literature, because of surrealism. Uh, because of Breton, because of poets she loved, poets that she lived with before France, and because of those four years in France, and because for some time she left behind in silence her mother tongue. Actually, I should not say her mother tongue. Her parents spoke Yiddish at home. So as she grew up, she already was that 
Miedo de ser dos, camino del espejo, as she writes, as she will write in Árbol de Diana, but before she will write that in French. Some of the poems that she, and this is what we feel with Forrest and with many other friends and Pessoa, um, Pessoa and Pizarnik lovers, Pizarnik did not intend these poems to be published. There's 20 poems, there's nine drawings and one etching in French. But the truth is she kept them. She kept them with her and when she goes back to Argentina in 64, she will put them together in a folder and that's how they came to Princeton, in a folder organized and with numbers, one, two, three, four, five. That is the order that we follow in the edition. These poems, Alejandra will go on to, in 68, start translating maybe one afternoon, maybe a couple afternoons, a couple nights. She does write in her diary in June of 67, go back to the French prose poems. Start trans translate them. The truth is that when she begins, and we see it in the manuscripts, we see it in the typescripts, she begins to do more than just translating. She begins giving titles to the pieces in pencil to the typescripts to not translate certain passages, to alter others, she begins to transcreate. And that transcreation will give uh, some poems in 68 from the French poems in 62, 63, uh, in Spanish in 68, in Spanish in 71, in El Infierno Musical. Around 12 poems out of the 30 texts that we have here uh, originally were born in a language that was not her own, that she had to learn first in Argentina and then uh, in Paris, on the streets of Paris, as she walked the streets, as she read through the night, and living in very meager, meager means uh, in, in, in the city that Pizarnik, like many others, felt that they had to visit and lived in, in order to have the right to consider themselves poets. Um, Paris, what, that, what was that uh, passage, of, of uh, rite of passage that uh, writers, and many writers before her, Cesar Vallejo, did it himself, right after publishing Trilce. Uh, Moro, Paz, right? so many poets. Uh, lived in a city that uh, no longer is the city that once was, but as Vallejo put it then, uh, era lejana, había que llegar de barco, eh, era grande, y era grande otra vez, porque no acababa. Y hoy quizás pienso en Nueva York como esa ciudad que no acaba. You need to translate that for <laughs> y vamos a leer un poco de poesía. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying you needed to translate that. To, to live in a city that was really grand, and beyond that, grand, even grander. And grand again, and far away, and, and, and beautiful. And, and in these poems, one of the, one of the beautiful um, aspects of, of this austerity was said today, of this labor was said today, and we can now understand maybe more because of what Anna and how she showed that in spite of what Pizarnik thought of herself as not having mastered the rhythm of the Spanish language, she would complain for years in her diaries, diaries that will be coming out with new directions uh, in, in a few years, a selection of Pizarnik's uh, diaries, um, of her uh, shortcomings uh, in, in, in poetry, in verse, and therefore, uh, due to this failure, so to say, she claims in her own diary, and I believe she did believe this, she needs to turn to prose poetry. True, she does turn to prose poetry because of poets she loves wrote in prose poetry. Rambo comes to mind, Baudelaire comes to mind. Uh, but we do see, and Anna showed it, how uh, Meter is uh, in poetry, even, and, and, and we, we, we hear, we hear um, uh, Tales Eliot here, uh, meter is in, 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 in free verse when free verse uh, is poetry. 
uh, and, and it does in Alejandra. And when she writes, and more and more, beginning with Arbol de Diana and beyond 62, and I believe, we believe, because of French poetry, she will turn to, uh, to the prose poem. And she will uh, master that in, in her own right. And her way to create rhythm will be uh, through repetition of, as Forrest said, estas palabras talismanes que Alejandra tiene. Viento, wind, uh, muerte, death, agua, water, mm, espejo. espejo, mirror, tristeza, sadness, uh, y miedo, uh, fear, eh, y en el cual crea un espacio, uh, this, this uh, talisman words, and creating uh, a space, and creating this palais du vocabulaire, as Alejandra called this vocabulary palace of words that she gathered and collected as she read. She reads poets and writes from, through, with poets. One of the words that we chose with Forrest for uh, one of the translations we did uh, was moaning water instead of crying water. In French is crying waters or waters crying, le pleurant or qui pleure. However, when you visit the archive, when you come to learn that Pizarnik most likely wrote this French poem Reading Joyce, Joyce uh, uh, chamber music, 1907, in a Neruda translation in Spanish, where Neruda translates Moan in Water by Sollozando. Then, as a translator, you think, Pizarnik, uh, the archive, just like Anna said, very well put. A poem tells you how to write, the, how to translate. Sometimes maybe the archive can tell you how to translate a poet. And that's where the poet, that's where the writer resides in the words, in the very words, in the words that he or she wrote, but perhaps in those that he or she gather from others. And it is really the case of Pizarnik. We find those poets that she loved all over the French poems. So let us hear Rimbaud, let us hear uh, Baudelaire, let, let us hear Apollinaire uh, in, in French, and yeah. the English translations that we did with, with Forrest, uh, with whom collaborating was a pleasure, a learning experience, uh, a, 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 a feast. Me pleasure, yeah. Do you want to start with sure. some Spanish? And, yeah. Um, as I start to read, I wanted to also thank Catalina Gomez, of the Hispanic Division Yo for también. making this possible. Siempre. The Allen Schutz International Writer Center at George Mason and, and Professor Heather Green, um, Suzanne Shadel, the yeah. Hispanic Division, um, the European direct. Division. So I wanted to make sure I said those. And here goes, here's some Arbol de Diana. Vamos. Diana's tree. I'll read in, in Spanish and English. Dos. Estas son las versiones que nos propone. Un agujero, una pared que tiembla. Two. These are the versions put forth to us. A pinhole, a wall that trembles. Cuatro. Ahora bien, ¿quién dejará de hundir su mano en busca del tributo para la pequeña olvidada? El frío pagará. Pagará el viento. La lluvia pagará, pagará el trueno. For now then, who will no longer dig his hand deep in search of tribute for the forgotten girl? The cold will pay, the wind will pay, the rain will pay, also the thunder. Six, seis, perdón. Ella se desnuda en el paraíso de su memoria. Ella desconoce el feroz destino de sus visiones. Ella tiene miedo de no saber nombrar lo que existe. Six. She undresses herself in the paradise of her memory, 
She's unaware of the ferocious destiny of her visions. She fears not knowing how to name what doesn't exist. Siete. Salta con la camisa en llamas de estrella a estrella, de sombra en sombra. Muere de muerte lejana la que ama el viento. Seven. She leaps with her shirt in flames from star to star, from darkness to darkness. She dies of a faraway death, the woman who loves the wind. Ocho. Memoria iluminada, galería, donde vaga la sombra de lo que espero. No es verdad que vendrá. No es verdad que no vendrá. Eight. Illuminated memory, gallery, from where the shadow of what I wait wanders. It's not true it will come. It's not true it won't come. Nueve. Estos huesos brillando en la noche, estas palabras como piedras preciosas en la garganta viva de un pájaro petrificado, este verde muy amado, este lila caliente, este corazón solo misterioso. Nine. These bones brilliant in the night, these words like precious stones in the living throat of a petrified bird. This beloved green, this hot lilac, this heart alone mysterious. Diez. Un viento débil, lleno de rostros doblados que recorto en forma de objetos que amar. Ten. A weak wind full of folded faces I cut into the forms of objects to love. Once. Ahora, en esta hora inocente, Yo y la que fui nos sentamos en el umbral de mi mirada. Eleven. Now, at this innocent hour, I and the one I was sit together at the threshold of my gaze. Trece. Explicar con palabras de este mundo que partió de mí un barco llevándome. Thirteen. Explain with words of this world that bore of me a boat elsewhere. Gracias. Let's do it. I get too excited to sit down and I read. <laughs> in uh, Gerardo Diaz Bartolome, great to have a diplomat translator. I think it should, yeah, set a precedent. Si pour une fois de nouveau, le regard bleu dans les sacs remplis de poussière, tu parles de moi. J'ai les droits. Cette attente, cette patience, si pour une fois de nouveau, qui me comprend Je parle de jouets brisés, je parle d'un sac noir. Je parle de moi, je peux le faire, je dois le faire. Si tout ce que j'appelle ne vient pas une seule fois encore, quelqu'un devra rire. Quelqu'un devra fêter une blague atroce. Je parle de la lumière sale qui court à travers la poussière. Les yeux bleus qui patientent, qui me comprend. Une seule fois encore, la petite main entre le jouet brisé, les regards de celle qui attend, écoute, comprend. Les yeux bleus comme une réponse à cet mort qui est à côté de moi, qui me parle et c'est moi. Si pour une fois de nouveau, mes yeux terrestres, ma tête enfoncée dans un sac noir, mes yeux bleus qui savent lire ce qui exprime la poussière, sa lamentable écriture, si pour une fois encore. If, for once again, the blue gaze inside this sack full of dust, I speak of myself, I have the right this expectation, this patience. If for once, again, who understands me? 
I speak of broken toys, of a black sack, of an expectation. I speak of myself. I can do it. I ought to do it. If everything I call doesn't come to me just once again, someone will have to laugh. Someone will have to toast with an atrocious joke. I speak of dust riven with sullen light, blue eyes patiently marking time. Who understands me? Just once again, the small hand among broken toys. Regard of her who waits, listens, understands. Blue eyes as a response to this death right next to me, which speaks to me and is me. If for once again, my earthen eyes, my head stuffed in a black sack, my blue eyes, which can read what dust scrawls, its pathetic handwriting, if again, each time, Parole du vent. Parole du vent, un cheval rouge traverse la mémoire d'anciennes nuits d'écrit. Les mal nés dans mes yeux qui se rappellent. Le monde a, les for a, le monde a la forme d'un cri. J'aurais aimé me voir dans une autre nuit, hors du délire d'être deux chemins du miroir. Le monde a la forme d'un cri. J'aurais aimé me voir dans une autre nuit, hors du délire d'être deux Chemin du miroir. Façon de voir, les yeux ouverts cherchent la dernière trace. Un cheval noir, un cheval rouge, amène des saisons colériques. On mord les bouts de son nom, on se perd dans les souvenirs d'un cri. Si tout est comme ça, où sont les rois du non-savoir Je m'étends sur les temps d'un galop. Des cris me traînent la captive d'une seule trace. J'entends le bruit de ce qui détruit le vent. Cheval de la colère, amène-moi loin de moi, loin de ce qu'écrit, loin de ce qu'écrit qui est à la place de la nuit. Words of the wind, a red horse careens across the memory of ancient wailing nights. Evil emerges from my memorious eyes, the world given form as a cry. How I would have loved to see myself some other night beyond this madness of being both sides of the mirror. Means of seeing, the opened eyes glimpse the dissolving trace. A red horse foretells choleric seasons. Chewing the end of its name, we lose ourselves in the memory of a howl, if everything is like that. Where are the kings of unknowing? I bend myself around the galloping hour, the hour of cries that drag me after them. Captive to a single trace, I hear the sound of what beats down the wind. Horse of ire, bear me far from myself, far from this cry that stands in for the night. Naked, fatigue of the body, transparent as a glass tree. Near yourself, you hear the brutal rumor of inextricable desire, night blindly mine. You're farther gone than me. Your name, uh, you're farther gone than me. Horror of checking for you in the screams of my poem. Your name is the disease of things at midnight. They had promised me one silence. Your face is closer to me than my own. Phantom memory, how I'd love to kill you. Nu, sommeil du corps transparent. Nu, sommeil du corps transparent comme un arbre de verre. Tu entends près de moi, tu entends près de toi la rumeur brutale d'un désir inextricable. Nuit aveuglement mienne. 
Tu es plus loin que moi, horreur de te chercher dans l'espace rempli des cris de mon poème. Ton nom, c'est la maladie des choses à minuit. On m'avait promis un silence. Ton visage est plus près de moi que le mien. Mémoire fantôme, comment j'aimerais te tuer. Yes. À toi les toi, à moi les moi, mémoire, armoire de gloire. Sale, sale de sel, toi en haut, anneau annulé, les années, les aînés, tout pèse et tremble. Étrange au cercle, aime-moi. Tu es lit, je dis, personne ne dit, rien dit. Le derrière du rideau fait l'amour avec les vents. J'attends qu'il finisse pour vivre sans toi, à l'ove, sans toi. Je me vois nu entre le déchet qu'on rejette, chacun son lieu de hurler et de dire une absence, chacun son absence chez Joissy, je suis pur, j'ai bu pour le revoir au fond du vin, ton cri en vain. <laughs> so, this one was both really hard and really fun to translate. To you, the view, to me, the months, memory, armoire of glory, Sullen salon of salt, you up high, announcement annulled, the arc, the archaic, everything's weight, strangles, strange circle, love me, it's your play, I say, no one says, nothing says, the back of the curtain makes love to the wind, I wait until they finish up living. Without you at dawn, without you, I see myself naked among the dross that we toss, each to her place, to cry, to speak, an absence to each her own absence. I've chosen, I've gone pure. I drank to see him again at the bottom of your wine, your cry in vain. Yeah, okay, that's good. Merci. Thank you. And uh, thanks again to Catalina Gomez. Donde esta Catalina? Ah, yeah, see. Sí. And to Suzanne Shadow. Um, and to Gwen. Gracias. Thank Gracias you. A Thank todas. you so much. Gracias a todos, por favor. Y a la poesía. Next up. <laughs> I actually have two questions, and we'll ask them both, and if somebody else wants to butt in, please do. Uh, did I understand correctly that a publisher had dismissed these poems as being uh, inconsequential? Yes, a French tr a publisher who publishes Pizarnik, who currently publishes Pizarnik. My God. In yeah. Paris, based in Paris. Whoa. <laughs> who happens not to be French? <laughs> there you go. And then my other question was, to what degree are the poets that you mentioned, Baudelaire, Rimbaud, uh, I think in the publicity there was also Artaud, um, either mentioned or reflected in a specific way in some of the poems you worked on? Do you know that or did she leave notes about that at all? We, we find uh, in, on, on her uh, manuscripts, notes, journals, specifically uh, her uh, diaries, um, quotes, uh, entire poems. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, in, uh, there's one particular notebook, maybe the most precious document that still is in Argentina because Alejandra um, gave it to, uh, to a friend of hers in Paris, uh, someone who still lives in, in Buenos Aires. Um, Yvonne Bordelois, and uh, the Green Notebook opens with a poem, actually with a, with a uh, clipping uh, of a, a picture of Dickinson. 
And, uh, and, 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 and we have uh, many poets that, I, that we didn't mention. Reverdi uh, is all over the place in that notebook, for instance. Uh, there is uh, uh, an instance of, I, I cannot now recall the, poet, the poem, but uh, Germain Nouveau is, is, is in one of the poems. There's one line that really echoes uh, uh, something that Germain Nouveau uh, wrote. And some, some of the writers, but she will not go and quote them, if you will, in her poems or, or leave the notes in the poems that she writes, uh, saying that this is what, you know, I'm taking this from this writer or that writer. But all of her elements with uh, which she worked, um, she did not dispose. She kept with her. They, they were part of her library, if you will, uh, this reading notebooks and, and journals. Janis Joplin also appears in one of her poems. Emma? Oh, no, oh. Lovely introduction and beautiful readings all around. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. I'll ask them real quickly. So this is Jordan Yamaji Smith, who is a great translator from the Japanese, uh, also um, fluent in Spanish. And Supuestamente. But it's nice to, nice to see you again, Forrest, and glad to be here. Um, two quick questions. One is, um, I really like how you're positioning this, you know, this volume as a kind of flow from her French um, antecedents and, and poets that she loved um, into Spanish. And I don't know much about the reception of these poems in the French literary community and what you see these poems as kind of giving back to the French. Like, is it, is it really sort of a flow in one direction, or does it cycle back? And if so, could you comment a little bit about what she's kind of contributing to, to French um, um, poetry? Just as a very basic question uh, from an ignorant perspective. And the second one is you ended the last comment talking about these journals again, and I'm very excited. And so the, the earnest nature of this question is just, can you give us a preview of the journals <laughs> that are coming out? But if you're involved in that project, which am, I'm I guessing you are, um, then is it possible to comment in a little bit more detail about what you think the journals might um, tell us about this project in, in particular? You can take the first. So the first question, the, as, as Patricio said, the, the poems weren't published in France, even though they had the opportunity to publish them. So they've had very little circulation, uh, probably um, among her friends in France, only during her life. But afterwards, even her work in Spanish became kind of cultish for a while. Right, th th these poems were in, in, in Princeton, uh, they were unpublished. These 30 texts were unpublished. Uh, some, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Cristina Pina, uh, who I contacted at the time because when I went to the archive and I, I, I saw French manuscripts, I had no idea that Pizarnik had written in, in, in French. So I contacted Pizarnik's biographer. And um, some people knew of the poems. Some uh, uh, eventually were published in, in, in a magazine in, in Switzerland a couple of years ago, but not, not, not as a book and not the complete, uh, what I believe are the complete poems. I, I try to see all the papers that are extant both in the archive in Princeton and, and papers with people in Argentina. Um, so these poems, uh, in terms of what they do, uh, what, is, what, what is it that the French are saying about these poems, I, I do not know. They just came out a couple of months ago. And I know the book has been sold. Uh, someone just sent me a picture of Shakespeare and Company with this on the shelf. I was very happy about it, uh, to see it. Um, but uh, I don't know if you want to comment anything else for us on what it does to French letters uh, or Anna. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the journals uh, will be not the. But you're not supposed to talk about this. Uh, for, forthcoming is a selection of prose uh, 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 um, of uh, Bizarnik, in which I'm, I'm not involved, but very, very good people are, and it's, it's going to be, I cannot wait to see, to see that out. Um, it, hopefully very, very soon, maybe in the fall, I'm not sure. And, and in a year, or in a year and a half, a selection of uh, the journals uh, will be published. The, there is an edition, the first edition of the uh, journals that came out, I believe, in the early 2000s uh, in Spain around 500 pages. Uh, a decade later, 
around, a I believe it's 1,092 pages came out, which is still not a selection, but not the complete. Some people are still alive. Some passages the family asked not to be published, uh, especially 1972, last year of her life, is not included in the last edition. Uh, therefore, we will not be able to include it. I do not know. I will try to include unpublished passages from the archive, but of course, I will have to talk to the people that have a say on, on the matter. I'm sure that New Direction will be ecstatic to, to, to publish unpublished material. We have it all in Princeton. All the diaries, as far as I know, for the two editions of the, di of the journals uh, are in Princeton. And, and, and 1972 is in Princeton because I read it, uh, and, and many of us have, have read. And, and it is, uh, for many literary critics, it is the first journal by a female author uh, in Latin America um, to have written the journal of, of a writer. We are reading. Uh, at times, literary confessions, at times, literary analysis of, of works, of poems, uh, states of the soul, the mind. Uh, suicide, of course, does permeate from the very beginning. But from the very beginning, we know what Alejandra is reading. We know that she's reading Proust five years before she goes to France. Um, we know what, how she complains about meter and rhythm. In, in the journals, in, in the entries, and she dates them. She did want to publish uh, some of her uh, entries, and she actually did publish them in France, um, in French, but not, uh, she did not do the translation. Someone else did the translations. In 1962, I believe, I believe in, uh, in La Revue Nouvelle, uh, some of the uh, entries came uh, out that she was writing in, 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 in Paris that year. And it's really interesting to see how she reworks and uh, whatever had a specific space in, in the original entry will no longer have uh, a specific space. Or names will disappear uh, and everything will become more uh, abstract, if, if you will, or, or more literary. And she is very conscious of what she's doing with her diary, with, with her journals. Um, so it is something that she would be very happy uh, that they are published and translated. She was very proud of that work that she was doing. She used it both as an atelier, as a place to think, and, and also as, as, as a product of literature that she was producing. I just wanted to say actually two things. One is that uh, I'm so delighted with the project because it restores a kind of solidity in the idea of Alejandro Pizarnik as this amazingly productive and um, amazing, amazingly productive, really, when one considers it and learn it, because so often she's seen as sort of this doomed, uh, tragic figure, but you know, she was full of life and words. The other thing I wanted to say, I was trying to think, who else collected words? I just read something, The Palaces of Words, and it's Patti Smith, um, who was almost a contemporary of that time in the 60s when they're both starting out in their little garrets. <laughs> yeah. And, um, Patti Smith, the singer and poet. Um, so I, you know, I, I like making that connection mm -hmm. that Patti Smith and mm -hmm. Alejandra Pizarnik are working to um, make a, and a, Patti Smith was also very influenced by some of the same French writers. Yeah. You know, oh, she was, was very taken sweet. by the, uh, the poet role that she felt like Baudelaire onward had, Rimbaud especially. Yeah. So I, I, I like that contact there with the palaces of words. Alejandra needed to start a band. Yes, yeah, so she needed Bob Dylan on yeah, the yeah. side. That just don't <laughs> have your pass. <laughs> Thank you so much.